Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Today's topic is I squared C. Uh, this video is meant to be a continuation of the previous uh, two videos that I did, which were uh, the Parallel Bus and UART. So if some of the topics in this video don't quite make sense or it doesn't seem like I've explained things, particularly like half duplex versus full duplex and synchronous versus asynchronous, please refer to the previous videos because they're meant to uh, build on top of each other. So I squared C uh, is an abbreviation. It stands for IIC. Uh, that's kind of where the square comes from. And it stands for inter IC communication. Uh, this protocol was developed by Philips, uh, which is now, uh, that division is owned by NXP. I squared C is fundamentally different than UART. The only thing that I squared C and UART have in common are that I, they still use the same kind of digital levels of low means zero and high means one, and that's about it. Uh, so in our... Uh, uh, discussion we're first going to talk about the uh, structure of I squared C we're going to talk about the advanced structure because it's really that complicated it's going to take two uh, two different instances to explain it we're going to talk about synchronous versus asynchronous in more detail we're going to talk about half duplex versus full duplex in more detail and we're going to talk about the wiring the first fundamental difference between your and I squared C is that I squared C is always half duplex. You do not have a full duplex option. Because I squared C is always half duplex, you always have an arrangement where you have one master talking to one or many other slaves, uh, similar to what we saw in your when you use the transceivers. You really never have to uh, write software uh, specifically for slaves, unless you're making you're rolling out your own network, and then that's kind of an advanced thing to do. Normally, you take an I squared C device like uh, EEPROM or DAC or ADC or temperature sensor uh, or I/O expander. There's a whole bunch of different I squared C devices, and then you hook them up to a single master. And that master is what then controls all of your slaves and talks to them, etc. So most of what we're going to be discussing uh, today are things that you need to do for a master. But you still have to understand what's happening inside a slave to be able to understand how the master is doing the things that it's doing. So the first topic that I want to talk about is the idea of a memory space. I squared C uh, uses this fundamental idea of a memory space to perform uh, all of the functions inside the slave. Uh, the master is a slightly different story. So the idea of a memory space, and the easiest way to think about this is an EEPROM. An EEPROM would be a non-volatile memory, and in the EEPROM, you store one byte at a time. So every byte in the EEPROM, starting from the beginning, or zero, has uh, an address. So this is the memory space this is, uh, of the EEPROM, and you have byte number zero, byte number one, byte number two, and then this continues for however large the EEPROM is. Uh, the, other th the, uh, the other quick thing is that if you notice that uh, after you get to nine, it goes A, B, C, D, E, uh, generally, the memory space is coded in uh, hexadecimal. So, just if you see letters popping up with numbers, that's what's happening. So, the thing about the memory space is the slave always has a pointer uh, in memory space. Uh, theoretically, whenever an I squared C device, uh, whenever an I squared C slave device comes online, the pointer is always pointed to zero. The, the memory address of zero. And then every time uh, you do a operation, uh, this pointer will get moved around depending on what operation you do. So now let's take a look, now let's kind of bring this together with what an I squared C packet actually looks like. And there are actually several different packets 
each one having uh, a different function. So first let's look a, take a look at what uh, writing to uh, a device looks like. So what you're looking at here, this entire thing, is a basic packet to write a single byte to an I2C I2 device. This is obviously far, far, far more complicated than uh, you are, which you have your start bit, 8 bits in the middle, end bit, and then you start over again. So let's uh, take the idea of a memory space. Let's talk. Let's say we're talking about a uh, EEPROM, so that it's the easiest to understand, and apply how uh, kind of dissect how this packet works. So the very first thing is you have a single bit, which is the start command. The start command is issued by the master, and the master initiates the bus to let all of the slaves know that information is going to be coming down the line. Uh, next are seven bits, which are the slave address. In I squared C, the master always has to know who it's talking to. So the slave address can't be just something willy-nilly. You have to either find it in the data sheet for the device that you're talking to, or uh, you have to set it in the device that you're talking to. Followed by uh, the following the slave address is a bit which is read or write. Uh, this bit tells the slave, is it going to be receiving data, or is it going to be sending data out? Uh, this section right here is 8 bits, or a single byte, and uh, this uh, is the simplest version of I squared C. There are some other I squared C uh, standards where this is larger to accommodate more uh, slaves. After you send the slave address and the read-write bit, the slave immediately has to respond with an ACK or NAC. The thing to understand here is this ACK or NAC is generated by the slave. The slave says, essentially, kind of raises the time going, I'm here, you can, you can talk to me. If there's nobody here, if there's nobody on the line that sends an ACK, the line is considered NAC, which if I had mentioned this, ACK stands for acknowledged, or NAC stands for not acknowledged. The default state of the line after the uh, slave address is sent is not acknowledged, and the slave has to pull the line low to acknowledge. So if this doesn't happen, uh, the master says uh, abort the transmission and uh, won't send the rest of the packet. Uh, that's something that's very unique to I2C is that as soon as you send out the slave address, the by the end of the slave address and the read-write bit, as soon as the master sees acknowledged or not acknowledged, uh, it will know if somebody is out there. So after you receive an ACK, an acknowledge, uh, this is where the idea of a memory space comes in, with the the next eight uh, bits, which are the data address. What the data address does in the memory space of the slave is it moves the pointer of where uh, uh, in what moves the pointer to a different location in memory space. So, for example, if I wanted to write a single byte to, let's say, uh, number three. This data address would be uh, zero uh, x zero three. And as soon as this data address is transmitted, this moves the pointer in the memory of the slave to data address three. Now that that has happened, the slave again must acknowledge that it received that command. Once the slave acknowledges, the master then sends the data, which is the next eight bits. Now, uh, the way the data here in this pointer uh, correlate is the slave, once it receives this eight bits of data, will write it to uh, data uh, location number three. Finally, the slave will acknowledge again, saying it received the data, and then once the master is done writing the single byte, 
it will uh, send a stop command to release the bus to let all of the other devices on the bus know that I am done transmitting. If you want to write more data than just a single byte, and you need to write the data consecutively, so for example, starting at three, you would go to four, five, six, seven, etc. So you want to write, you know, eight bytes in a row. The only real difference in the, this packet structure is instead of sending the stop command, like you would when you're sending a single byte, you would just send your next piece of data right afterwards, followed by the acknowledged or not acknowledged. Because what also makes I2C interesting is that after a data uh, packet is written, so let's say a data packet is written to uh, location 3, the pointer is automatically advanced to the next location. So the next incoming uh, data packet gets written to location 4, and then the next incoming data packet is written to location 5, and so on. That makes I2C, particularly in, let's say, uh, an EEPROM, really easy to work with because if you have to write a whole bunch of data at the same, you know, in a row consecutively, you only really need to initiate uh, your uh, data address and then just send all of your data packets. So as far as I'm aware, there's no real limit to how long an I2C packet can be and the slave will respond to it uh, uh, by uh, just moving the pointer and following along. Now that we know what a write in I2C looks like, let's take a look at what a read in I2C looks like. The structure is very similar, but there are some subtle nuances. The first thing is you have your uh, start bit, and this signifies the bus to start. Then you have your slave address, and the last bit of the slave address is, you, this would be instead set to uh, read instead of write. Then uh, the slave must respond with an ACK for this to continue. And this is where the fur, the, this is where the difference between reading and writing happens. After this, after the slave sends this ACK, then it sends the data. The question is, what data does it send? The slave sends the data of where the pointer is currently sitting. So if the pointer is sitting at data uh, address 3, the first byte of data returned would be data 3. Afterwards, uh, the master uh, will NAC at the end of at the end of one complete read cycle, uh, the master NACs, and then the master uh, sends a stop. If you wanted to read more than a single byte of data in a row, uh, it's very simple. All you would do is, instead of NACing at the end here, you would, this would be a ACK. Again, in this case, this ACK would be sent by the master, telling the slave that I just received the data that you sent me, then you would send in uh, with the ACK as a trigger, the slave then transmits the next piece of data. So if this first piece of data was 0x03, this address, the pointer gets auto-incremented to 4, so this would be 0x04. Again, this would be data. And you would continue acking, so let's say this is another ACK. And once you ACK, the slave sends another piece of data. This would be 0x05. And uh, to stop this, you would send the NAC. And finally, the stop to stop the bus. If you didn't already realize, the downfall of this particular packet structure is that you're limited to reading data specifically from where the pointer is. 
Well, what do you do if the pointer is not where you want it to be? How do you move the pointer? The way you move a pointer in the memory space of an I squared C slave device is with a dummy write. A dummy write is a write that fulfills the fact that it sends the slave address and the data address, but it never actually writes anything. So all of this happens together in a row. I just don't have enough board space to be able to write all of it out. So you send a start request. Then you send the slave address with uh, the read write bit set to write. The slave then acknowledges, and then you send the uh, data address. Sending this data address moves the pointer someplace else in memory. So let's say it was sitting at three and instead we wanna to go to eight here. After the data address is moved, the slave acknowledges again. After the acknowledge of the slave, the master then sends a restart command. The restart command uh, essentially resets the slave to go from the uh, write operation to a new input. The restart not it really depends on what your specific I squared C slave device supports because I've seen them go both ways that you have a restart which is its own separate command it, it sits by itself or sometimes you'll have a stop here and then a start here so it depends on how it's implemented you really have to check uh, the I squared C slave device that you have so uh, in the uh, protocol that was put out by Philips, you use a single restart command. After the restart command, you send the slave address, again, similar to this, but now instead of sending a, a, a write command, you send a read command, like we did in the previous packet that we looked at. After the read command, the uh, slave acknowledges and immediately sends the data that's sitting in a byte address eight. The master then acknowledges telling the slave that I received that byte. Uh, then uh, the pointer is moved from address data address eight to let's say data address nine. And the slave reads out so let me switch sides here. The slave then reads out the next byte. And now to finish the read, the master knacks so that the slave doesn't try to send another byte. And then finally it stops the bus. As you can tell, uh, the, uh, this data structure is far, far, far more complicated than uh, you are. What makes this data structure better than you are is that, as I mentioned earlier, as soon as the slave address and the read write bit are sent out, the master immediately knows whether the uh, slave act or not. And this gives you uh, feedback about what's happening on your bus. Uh, in contrast with UART, a UART just sends something out and hopes it gets there. You know, the wires could be clipped off and just hanging there, but UART will still be sending data out. Whereas with uh, I squared C, you get direct feedback as to what's going on. So now let's take a look at the packet structure in a little more detail. These scribbles right here represent the two uh, communication lines that make up I squared C. I squared C has a data line and a clock line. Uh, the first thing to note is this clock line is what makes I squared C uh, synchronous versus UART, uh, which is asynchronous. The clock line is provided by the master, and the clock line tells the slave at what speed, you know, synchronized to these clocks. Uh, to uh, output bits to the bus or read bits from the bus. Also, uh, the slave talks on the same data line as the master does, and this is why there's this uh, game or ballet, whatever you want to call it, dance, 
of sending acts and knacks and necessitating the clock because if the master and slave tried to do the same something on the bus at the same time you would get a collision so let's see what the voltage level so right high voltage level low voltage level for the sda pin the data pin and high voltage level low voltage level for the scl pin which is the clock pin so the very first thing that's sent on the bus is the start condition. And uh, the bus, when idling, meaning nothing is happening, is idling high. This is the same for UART, and that's actually, in both cases, with UART and I2C, a great diagnostic tool. My, uh, my bus isn't working, set the bus to idle, check to see what the le uh, voltage levels of the bus are, and if, let's say, one of these is low, then that will tell you that something is wrong for other than uh, there's a bug in your code. So the very first thing the master does is check to see is the bus free, and that means it's idling with both lines high. Then it sends the start condition. This right here is the start condition. In the start condition, the data line is pulled from high to low first before the clock line is pulled from high to low. This data line first, clock line second, uh, tells all of the other devices that something's about to come through, let's start listening. After the start condition, now the eight uh, slave address uh, bits are sent. If you've never seen this kind of uh, notation before, uh, this means that uh, the, the line could be either high or low during this time. So if you kind of cover up the low part, or the line looks like it's high, and if you cover up the high part, the line looks like it's low. So this could be either a zero or a one all the way down, so you have the seven slave uh, address bits, then you have the uh, final, uh, this is the read write bit. And notice how each bit is synchronized with a single clock pulse of the clock. This is how the slave knows when to read in a bit. That the bit is set to the bus before the clock line, and then the clock line toggling high tells the slave that, oh, it's now time to read the bus for this particular bit. And then the line goes low, the master resets the, the next bit onto the bus and toggles the clock line. So this continues all the way up until right here. Let me switch sides. Right here, this is the acknowledged or not acknowledged bit. As I mentioned previously, when this bit it shows as acknowledged, it goes low. Because the bus idles high, the slave must pull this bit low to signify that uh, I am out here, I am responding to you. If there's no slave out there, all of this would be successful up to this point, and when the master releases the data line and sends another clock pulse, the data line uh, will st stay high because nobody acknowledged, and the transmission would end right here. What I put up here, including what's down here, is the dummy write before a read. So once the slave address and uh, the write command is sent out, the slave acknowledges, and the data line stays high, the clock line stays low, and we continue right down here. So now, uh, the again, the master will uh, set the uh, bit high or low and then toggle the clock line and then reset the bit and then toggle the clock line and this continues all the way until eight bits are sent and then again you have the condition of the acknowledge that the slave uh, must pull the line low while the master toggles the clock line. Uh, a big misconception about I squared C is that, well, you can wait for the slave to pull the line low for an acknowledge. And this is false. Uh, the slave has only the amount of time that is this clock pulse right here to be able to pull the line low. And that's it. There's, there's nothing else it can do. So, 
after you sent out the, the eight bits, you one more clock, pu clock pulse is initiated, and then you see whether the line got pulled low or not, and you're done. If the line didn't get pulled low, the slave didn't respond. Finally, you send a stop condition. In the stop condition, the data line, I'm sorry, the clock line goes high first, and then the data line goes high. This tells the slave that uh, a stop condition has occurred. Now is the perfect opportunity to talk about the baud rate. How does the baud rate of I2C work? It's quite simple. The baud rate is the speed at which the, uh, the pulses from the clock line happen. I2C uh, uses some standard baud rates, uh, 100 kilohertz, 400 kilohertz, and 1 megahertz are very common I2C uh, speeds. Uh, the thing, as I mentioned previously, uh, because the master is sending the clock signal to the slave, the slave does not need to know the baud rate ahead of time. It clocks itself to the clock line. Uh, the downfalls there though are that uh, generally if you, like if for example you have a slave that can only handle up to a 100 kilohertz baud rate you can't send it a 400 kilohertz baud rate also uh, some slaves will have the ability to reject noise so if a slave is set up for a 400 kilohertz baud rate and you send it a 100 kilohertz baud rate but the slave has the feature in it to reject noise, it could reject the 100 kilohertz baud rate as noise because it's happening slower than what it's expecting. So in this noise canceling mode, the slave will have uh, a range, you know, uh, with the nominal baud rate being right in the middle, and then the, uh, a high range and a low range that if it detects signals that are faster, then that range or slower than re that range, uh, those signals will be rejected. To better understand how I2C functions and how I2C is wired, here's just kind of a little simplified diagram of what the innards of an I2C module look like. The big difference between UART and I2C is that uh, the uh, transmit pin on a, a in a UART module actually supplies power so then that the receive pin can sense that power and the transmit pin toggles the power up and down. The thing about I2C and this is actually to prevent damage to the I2C bus uh, is that the I2C bus does not actually provide any power coming out of its pins both SDA and SCL. The reason for this is imagine if the uh, SDA pin is supplying power and the uh, uh, on the receiver side the slave is grounding. So what you get is a short circuit. You get the SDA pin the, from the master is sending power to the slave and the slave is grounding it and this could damage something. So to prevent this the neither the master nor any of the slaves provide power. The way uh, the I squared C bus gets wired is you have to have, and I repeat this again just because it's that important, is you have to have pull-ups. A resistor that connects the data and clock line individually to uh, power, whatever your bus voltage happens to be. And then uh, for the master to transmit, the master uh, will then, oops, that's in the wrong direction because they're both end channels. The master then will use an end channel FET to ground the line to make a low, and it will turn off the end channel FET to raise the line back high. While it's doing this, it also uh, has a tap off of that line that it uses for sensing. Because for example, if the master commands the line to be high by turning off the FET and the line is still low, this is how a master can determine that a bus collision has occurred. The same thing happens for the clock line. 
the master toggles the clock line up and down with the end channel FET, and then it senses what the clock line is doing, and then the sensing is actually what the master uses to drive its internal circuitry. Because This is because there's one condition where the slave can control the clock line, and it's a condition known as clock stretching. What the slave can do is if the slave needs a second, you know, just needs a little bit of extra time to prep the data that the master is waiting for, the slave can hold the, data, the clock line low, which in turn actually pauses the, uh, the master because the master is looking at what the clock line is doing, even though it's using the FET to toggle the line at the time, the circuitry of the uh, uh, I2C module is held paused until the slave releases the uh, clock line. So then how does this uh, get wired together? It's actually super, super simple. So if this is your master, you then have a slave. The slave has the same uh, SDA and SCL lines. And then these lines just get tied together like this. And then they require a pull-up to whatever your VDD is. And then this one gets the same thing. Pull up to VDD. Couple of things to note. With these pull-ups, you have to be careful because if you make the resistance value too low, let's say 10 ohms, uh, the master will, won't be able to pull the line down and can result in damage. If you make the value too high, let's say 100K, what can happen is when the master releases the data line from a low state to a high state, it takes too long to come up and you can get some weird, weird things happening. Uh, the resistor values for the pull-ups are usually somewhere between 2.2K to uh, 10K. Also, something to note, if you have more than one I2C device, let's say you have another slave. Here is the ASCL, like that. All you do is you connect the SDA line to SDA and you connect the SCL line to SCL, but you do not add more resistors. This is very critical that you only need a single set of pull-up resistors per I2C bus. Also, the more devices you have on the bus, the bus will actually start to uh, gain some capacitance. And the more capacitance the bus has, the lower these values have to be. So be careful about how many devices you have on the bus and what resistors you use. This has been a basic introduction to I2C. We talked about how I2C is synchronous, that it uses a clock line to tell its slaves at what speed to bring in the data. Uh, I2C is half duplex. There is a single data line that's shared by all of the devices so that if the master talks, the slaves have to be quiet and then the master has to be quiet for the slaves to respond. And so that's about it for I2C. Um, if you have any questions, you can always uh, shoot me an email or leave a comment in the comment section. Uh, the next communication protocol that I would like to uh, discuss is a uh, SPY or the Serial uh, Peripheral Interface. Thank you for watching.